します。This is no food. You want to go ice fishing? Don't get your nose on the table. One of the challenges of cabin life is that when you go out for any length of time, the fire goes out and the cabin gets cold again. Talked about in a previous episode how you need to Make sure that everything you have in the cabin, including your food, is okay to freeze. And freeze and thaw, which can be bad for some foods, right? I'm in here sharpening the ice auger to go back out uh, ice fishing, and it's still cold in here. So you always want to have your, your warm gear at close at hand so you can throw it on while you're heating the cabin up again. And there's nothing wrong with that. I don't mind that at all. It's the same with the outhouse. It's just a matter of what you're used to. Once you get used to going out to the, a cold outhouse, just throw your jacket on, your warm coat and a hat and go out, do your business and come back in. It's not a big deal.
table. Back up, please. Five. Good girl. Good.
Okay, so here's the uh, fresh rainbow trout. Rainbow trout's not actually native to Ontario, Canada. It's a West Coast fish uh, here in Canada. And we have them stocked in a lot of our lakes though, including our Great Lakes where they are called steelhead because they migrate upstream uh, to spawn in the ocean. There's the steelhead live in the salt water and then they move up into freshwater streams to spawn. So they're still called steelhead. We've stocked them from the west coast in a lot of Ontario, especially the Great Lakes. But these little rainbow trout are stocked in a lot of the smaller lakes. So they're available for us as sportsmen to catch under the Ontario fishing regulations. So we've got three small ones here. I'm going to cut those up right now, flay them and uh, cook them on the fire and, and uh, have some dinner well, along with some chili. No, oh, this knife is dull for some reason. Uh, people ask about sharpening knives. You saw me sharpening the the uh, auger, the ice auger for drilling the, the hole, the ice fishing hole earlier. And that's actually a Mora, believe it or not. I've had that for a lot of years. Those blades come off, they're replaceable, and they're sharpenable. But one of the things, points I wanted to make about sharpening is that you don't typically need to actually sharpen on a stone. That ice auger hadn't been done in a while, so I needed to get some nicks out of it. But typically all you need to do is strop a knife. I can see this knife from some of that woodworking I was doing earlier. When I hold it like that, especially with the light from the camera on it, I can actually see metal, like reflection on the edge of that blade. That means that spot's dull. Uh, because if I'm looking straight down on the sharp part, down to this part of the knife, you don't see anything, there's no reflection. This part of the knife has a reflection, so I know that part needs to be sharpened. By what leather strop, of course, this is what I'm talking about. You can make these easy enough. I got this one at Lee Valley years ago, but on one side I leave raw leather. And literally what I need to do is replace this leather because I've put some nicks in, in it by being careless as I'm stropping. On this side I have some jeweler's compound for polishing jewelry. That's the finer finishing. That's a really, really fine sort of like a clay I guess uh, probably is clay actually or ceramic so what you want to do is maintain that blade edge or that uh, blade angle consistently so when you're dragging that across essentially sharpening of any kind is simple it's really a matter of just maintaining the blade angle all the way through whether you're on a stone or a strop and you'll get a feel for that the more you do it as you're pulling that across, it'll have a different sound if you're off, either too uh, too steep of a of a, an angle or too shallow of an angle. If it's just right, you won't see any sunlight behind this blade. And if it's too steep, it disappears. So you're going to kind of turn the knife until that space disappears and no further. If you go further, you're going to put, roll that edge over. And then you might need to put it on a stone to get it back into shape. So by doing this, especially with a good light, again, just maintain that same angle all the way through. You know, people ask, how do you sharpen a knife? And I can never get my knife sharp. There's nothing more to it than just that. What you're trying to do is do enough passes on one side, maintaining that angle perfectly, that you create a slight burr rolling the other way. Then you would come to this side, Especially if you're using stones with varying degrees of coarseness, you start off with coarse and you work down to fine. So each time 
you're going to create that burr so it rolls over the other side then you go to a finer stone go back to the other side you roll that burr back over this way and keep going till you're down to the straw or a steel or a ceramic and at that point that that's so uh, soft and so fine that it might create a tiny little burr on that last pass but it's going to be so fine that it's not going to impact the sharpness of the knife so I can see by already doing this that I might need a stone on this knife because I probably when I was carving that hardwood or I guess I hit a knot when I was carving the edge of that uh, bench and it's only red pine so it's soft but the knots are quite hard so let's see if I can get this sharp Sometimes I'll just use my other hand to apply even pressure. To apply even pressure. And then I can keep an eye on that angle to make sure I'm maintaining zero gap underneath that blade. I'd like my fish really simply put it. So a little bit of salt, or a little bit of a whole wheat flour garlic powder rags which goes on everything you can see where I get that in the link below from Amazon uh, I like a little bit of spice typically I guess I'll not this time yeah, a bit of onion and some salt and pepper which of course makes it Buddy Sean James here for My Self Reliance. Well, it's another beautiful day in central Ontario. It with a couple of buddies ice fishing on a small lake near Algonquin Park. Hiked back in here earlier today with our gear, with our sleds, and a and a hot tent to 
set up and spend the night out here. Hot tent being a canvas tent with a wood stove in it. The sun's been beating down on us on this north shore. It's still cold of course, but it's, it's nicer than if it was just cloudy and windy and snowy. So we're camping on this north shore so that when the sun comes across the horizon it's shining in on us all day, which is something we do pay attention to when we're out here. You know, things like sun orientation and prevailing winds and snow conditions and things like that determine where are comfortable places to set up camp. And it's just a reminder to me how in tune you have to be when you live a little bit closer to the land and spend a little bit more time outdoors. You know, whenever I visit a city, especially Toronto, which is a few hours away, and I go into a mall with my family, or I visit um, family or friends who live in apartment buildings or condominiums that are linked especially to an underground mall and have retail stores within the condominium or the apartment complex. The people that I, friends are, are related to, often don't even own warm clothing. They don't have winter boots, they don't have winter hats or proper winter coats that they can wear outside. And often they wouldn't put them on even if they had them. In fact, they never even see the light of day. They never go outside. Yeah, that might occur for weeks at a time. They, they just go straight from their apartment or their condominium down into the underground or onto the subway. They go to work and they never step outdoors. Then they shop on the way home for groceries or clothing or whatever and they never actually step outside you know, and feel the weather, feel the, the cold or the warmth or the sun or the rain or the snow. And I just can't believe that that's healthy. I just can't believe that humanity is meant to live that way. And of course here I am sitting in the Canadian wilderness and I can hear a jet flying overhead so it's kind of appropriate but a little bit annoying while I'm trying to talk to you. You know and as the world population becomes more urbanized we lose that more and more of that connection, yet the majority of the population often dictates policy, often dictates how our governments react and manage resources, and manage nature, manage wild spaces. And if the majority of the population no longer has any understanding of nature because they never step foot in it, never step foot in true wilderness, then how can that possibly be good for the earth? How can they possibly be making the right decisions or um, have a real truly deep understanding of how things should be or how they were in the past? And we're losing, of course, that connection to the past, especially when the majority of people who actually do get outside often still live in the city and, and they're infrequent visitors to the outdoors. And I've been that way myself in the past. Uh, not a judgment, it's just the way that our society has uh, become and how we function as a society. Uh, we tend to gravitate towards the easier things and of course living in a city is very easy. Think about that, you don't have to own a coat, you don't have to own winter boots in Canada because you never step outside and actually have to deal with the elements. So we have that disconnect for you know maybe five or six out of seven days in a week and then we rush out into the wilderness to to uh, participate in outdoor activities, whether that's fishing or canoeing or cross-country skiing or snowshoeing right now or ice fishing like we're doing right now, then uh, you know we kind of get some of that connection. But it takes some time out here to actually start, you know, getting immersed in it and actually start settling down, slowing down, and listening to the rhythms of nature. We're used to the rhythms of, of modern society, where you know the watch dictates everything and you know, our work and our other obligations are what we schedule everything around. We don't care about the cycles of nature. In fact, we don't even care about daylight. We don't care when the sun goes down because we flip a switch on. We don't care when the sun comes up because, again, we have uh, under artificial light. We have running water. We don't care if the lake's frozen. We turn on the tap and water comes out. So it's such a, a complete disconnect that we can't possibly expect to make a full deep connection one or two days a week or one day a month or or whatever frequency we do get outside, it really takes a long period of time to make that connection again and to understand what's going on around you. You know, things like what's going to happen to the weather right now. Like we have a crystal clear sky right now, complete uh, blue sky, not a cloud in the sky. And the sun's starting to set um, 
over the western hills over here. I know a system's coming in, the wind's starting to pick up, it's starting to uh, turn a little bit, and you can feel uh, some moisture in the air, and that's uh, snow that's coming. But I wouldn't be able to feel that connection generally. Now, here I am a couple of hours later, the super moon or blue moon or whatever they call this um, amazing full moon on January 30th, 2018. It's rising over the old growth white pines behind me. I'm looking out at the sun that just set down through a valley with the hardwood bridge on the left and hemlock grove on the right across this lake. I just had a fantastic fishing on today and it's getting really cold. It's going to be an uncomfortable night but look what I get to witness. You know, this discomfort that I'm experiencing out here today from the cold, you know, taking my gloves off to handle the fish in the freezing cold water, and sleeping in this tent tonight, the fire is going to die down in the middle of the night. It's going to reach maybe minus 22 to minus 25 in that tent by morning. But what's a little bit of discomfort when you get to witness this? We never put ourselves in uncomfortable situations. We never experience discomfort. How can we appreciate the comfort? And I truly believe that. I truly believe that we need to put ourselves in situations that are uncomfortable, that test our limits, test our resolve, test our abilities. Get outside and push your limits. It shows you what you're capable of. It shows you what your limitations are. And, and um, I think more than anything, it, what it does is shows you that you, what you fear, those things that you fear in life, if you just go out and confront them head on, that they're not nearly as bad as you thought they were. So, so many people, including the majority of people who live in this country and experience these winters, they don't actually experience them. They never get out and face them. And they're actually fearful of, of camping in winter in particular. Even the busiest provincial parks and national parks in Ontario or probably throughout Canada are dead. There's nobody there in the winter. There's nobody out there experiencing them, but they're just as beautiful as they are in the summer. And we just have this idea that uh, we have to hibernate during the winter, that we can't face these tough conditions. But once you do it, you get out there, you experience the tough conditions, you ex push your limits, you get to witness beauty like this. Look at it. Listen to the ice booming around me. It's so cold that that uh, pressure cracks are building up and just exploding. The trees are actually exploding in the woods as well as the sap expands, so I'm surrounded by only those noises and nothing else. There is a wolf pack in the area, so we might hear the wolves tonight, which with the full moon and, and uh, this clear sky and the beautiful endless forest in front of me here, that would be quite an experience. Um, but like I said, you have to be here to experience it. You have to be out, you have to push your limits, you have to get outside your comfort zone in order to, ex to experience this beauty and not just watch it on TV like you're doing right now or that you've done by watching other shows. And of course, as you know, I'm not uh, professing to be the expert. I don't profess to be, you know, the extreme adventurer. Uh, the, uh, I'm not a person who goes much more beyond what you're capable of or, or what you currently do. It's just that I, I don't let fear, I don't let the discomfort stop me from getting out and, and enjoying it. I'm just, I think I'm just gonna sit out here and just let the sky go completely dark watch the full moon come across the lake here from our warm tent on the shoreline i can just duck in when i get cold come back down to the shoreline and and just continue to watch and watch the stars start to appear i don't know how much of this is in focus i'm going to show it to you anyway because it's uh it's a surreal moment and i would really want you to share this with me <laughs> 